Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the muscles of the posterior compartment of the leg. Now, remember that in general language, when we say leg, it usually refers to the entire lower extremity, both the thigh and this lower part, which is technically the leg. But in anatomical terms, up here, which contains the quadriceps, and you can see the hamstring muscles right here, this would actually be the thigh, and this down here is the leg. So if you're looking for uh, the hamstring muscles, um, that's in a separate video, uh, but it's already complete at this point. So here, we'll be discussing the origins, insertions, innervations, actions, and a few other aspects of these muscles in the leg's posterior compartment. So this region right here in purple, where we see flexor digitorum longus, tibialis posterior, and flexor hallucis longus, these are going to be the deep muscles of the posterior compartment, and we'll be covering those in the next video. What we're going to be covering here are the superficial muscles. So these are the most posterior, okay? And those, of course, are going to be the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and then we're also going to see another muscle not shown here called the plantaris. Um, it's also worth mentioning, and we covered this earlier, that these two parts of the posterior compartment, the deep region and the superficial region, are separated by an extension of the deep fascia here called the transverse quirl septum. And so there are generally three muscles here. We have the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and the plantaris. Okay? Uh, now, when we're looking at these three muscles, if we're just referring to the first two, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, these two muscles collectively uh, sometimes are referred to as the triceps surae. Okay? Surae refers to the fact that they're in the sural region, because remember the back side of the leg, this is sural. The anterior side would actually be the crural side. This is the sural side. And why is it triceps? There's only two muscles. Well, that's because the gastrocnemius has two heads. Okay? There's a medial head over here and then a lateral head over here. So two heads of the gastrocnemius and the soleus comprise the triceps surae. All right, and then we also have the plantaris, which is not included in that list under triceps surae. Okay, so first let's talk about the gastrocnemius. Gastrocnemius is a two-headed muscle, has a lateral head and a medial head, um, and both of these heads are going to originate up here on the femur. Now both of these muscles have been cut, okay, but at some point, probably around like right here, they're going to completely fuse and they'll just run together as the calcaneal tendon. And their insertion is really going to be the calcaneal tendon. In some sources you'll see it as calcaneal tendon, in some sources you'll see it as the calcaneus. Recall that the calcaneus is the heel bone. And so arising uh, superiorly off of the heel bone, we have this very large and thick tendon called the calcaneal tendon. Now, the common name for this is the Achilles tendon. Okay? A calcaneal and Achilles tendon are one and the same. Uh, it's worth noting that this tendon is the largest tendon in the human body. Okay? Um, and it's very important that it's large, in humans in particular, because humans are about the only species that uh, consistently walk upright. And so the fact that we walk upright, or have the ability to do so, is in part aided by the fact that this tendon is so large. Okay? In any case, the two heads of the gastrocnemius are going to fuse roughly at about halfway down the length of the soleus and continue as one unit toward the calcaneal tendon. Right? And so the calcaneal tendon will then insert on the calcaneus. Uh, now, when we look at these two heads, how do we differentiate these? Because this isn't really a, a super detailed picture. Um, I can't really tell, like maybe this right here is the big toe. I can't tell uh, which leg are we looking at, left or right. Well, there's a few ways that we can tell. Um, one way is to actually look at the plantaris muscle, and we'll come back to this in a minute. But the origin of the plantaris is on the lateral condyle of the femur. So this side where this muscle plantaris is originating, this would actually have to be the lateral side. Okay? In other words, this over here would then have to be the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. This one over here would have to be the medial head. Probably the best way to differentiate the medial head of the gastrocnemius from the lateral head is just to simply know that the medial head actually originates a little bit farther up than the lateral head. Notice that when we look at the origin of the medial head, it's actually at a higher point, whereas the lateral head originates slightly farther down. 
Okay, And this can be a really useful way to differentiate these two heads when you have an absence of other information. For example, if the plantaris is not shown, uh, then you wouldn't have that as a reference point to know that the lateral condyle would be over here. And also, if these hamstring muscles were a little bit unclear, which leads us to the next way to differentiate them. There's one other way to tell. Um, the other way to tell is to look at the hamstring muscles. Recall that on the lateral side, we only have one of them inserting on this side. So we only see one muscle here. This is the biceps femoris. Over on this side, we actually see two muscles. If you look closely, you can see two muscles. And so this would have to be the medial side. Uh, one of these, uh, the superficial one, is probably the semitendinosus, the deeper one, semimembranosus. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. So that can allow you to differentiate these two heads if you're not given much other context. And so the origins of these two heads are pretty straightforward. The lateral head is going to originate on the lateral condyle of the femur, and the medial head is going to originate on the medial condyle of the femur. And as I mentioned, the muscles, the two heads, are going to fuse into one belly, and they're going to come down here and insert on the calcaneal tendon, uh, which is going to insert on the calcaneus. And so really for this, we just consider the insertion the calcaneus. Right? Now for the action of this muscle, it's going to facilitate plantar flexion. And the easiest way to think about plantar flexion is basically stand up and go on your tippy toes. That motion of the ankle joint is plantar flexion. Okay? And so the way that's working, we can, uh, we can visualize it here. Uh, remember that the insertions are generally pulled toward the origin. So when the gastrocnemius contracts, the calcaneus is going to be pulled upward uh, toward the origins of the gastrocnemius. And so by pulling the calcaneus upward, it's going to be pulled off the ground. And so when you go on your tippy toes, the heel comes off the ground. And so that's going to be the action of the gastrocnemius. The other thing that's worth mentioning is it's going to assist in knee flexion. Okay? Now when we think of knee flexion, we think of the hamstrings. They're the agonists of knee flexion. Uh, the gastrocnemius can assist in that. It's not the prime mover of knee flexion, but it assists. And the reason it's able to assist is because the gastrocnemius is a two-joint muscle. Okay? Uh, notice that uh, the gastrocnemius actually originates uh, proximal to the knee joint, but actually distal to the ankle joint. So it actually spans two joints. And so that's why it mainly is going to uh, be the agonist of plantar flexion, but it can also assist in knee flexion. And remember, those, uh, those muscles that have two separate actions at two separate joints, in order to have that, they have to cross both joints. We're not going to see that in the case of the soleus. Okay? So this green muscle right here, this is the soleus. Notice that its origin is not as far up as that of the gastrocnemius. In fact, the soleus does not originate on the femur. The soleus is actually going to originate on the posterior surfaces of the fibula and the tibia. Okay? So this being the lateral side over here on the right, uh, this would actually be the fibula over here, and then over here it's going to originate on the tibia. Right here we see the portion of the calcaneal tendon that's the insertion of the gastrocnemius. However, it's a very thick tendon. So the soleus, if we were to continue distally or downward, we would actually see that it would also insert on the calcaneal tendon. And since the calcaneal tendon also inserts on the calcaneus, then the soleus too inserts on the calcaneus. So we can say that the action of the soleus is also to plantar flex the foot, just like the gastrocnemius. So stand up and go on your tippy toes and the heel comes off the ground because the soleus is also lifting that heel or that calcaneus, the insertion toward its origin. Now, the soleus does not originate on the femur. It originates distally to the knee joint. So it's actually only crossing one joint. That's the ankle joint. And so this is why the soleus does not assist in knee flexion. It only deals with plantar flexion. Okay? Also, like I mentioned, uh, these th muscles right here, the two heads of the gastrocnemius and the soleus, they are collect collectively referred to as the triceps surae. Right? Now we have one other muscle. This is kind of the minor one, the one that people talk about the least. It's called the plantaris muscle. Now we already mentioned this. We mentioned that the plantaris actually has a lateral origin up here. Its origin is actually the lateral condyle of the femur. Um, it's a much thinner muscle than these other ones. If we follow the muscle distally or downward, we'll actually see that it's going to insert on the calcaneus. Now, it eventually does fuse 
with the calcaneal tendon, or Achilles tendon, and of course the calcaneal tendon inserts on the calcaneus. Now, its actions are going to be plantar flexion, as we might guess, because it's going to insert on the calcaneus, so it's going to pull the calcaneus upward toward the origin, so it works with plantar flexion, although it doesn't contribute a great amount of it. It's not a very strong muscle. The vast majority of plantar flexion is provided by the gastrocnemius and the soleus, with the edge, of course, going to the gastrocnemius. Uh, the plantaris also aids in flexion of the knee. Um, the reason it's able to do that is because the plantaris, like the gastrocnemius, is also a two-joint muscle. Okay? Now, in terms of that assistance in knee flexion, the gastrocnemius takes precedent over the plantaris. Plantaris is overall a pretty weak muscle. Um, in terms of that knee flexion, again, the prime movers are hamstrings up here, and the gastrocnemius only assists, and then the plantaris assists even less than the gastrocnemius. So hopefully that makes sense. So if you associate uh, these three muscles with one thing, it's going to be plantar flexion of the ankle, and then only the gastrocnemius and plantaris assist with knee flexion. Now one other thing about the plantaris muscle. I've already mentioned that it's very, very small and very, very thin and doesn't contribute much to either plantar flexion or knee flexion. In fact, it's so small that some people actually consider it to be more of a proprioceptive muscle rather than serving an actual biomechanical role. Meaning that instead of really contributing to these two motions, um, instead it's actually serving as a sensor uh, so that the body knows the status of the ankle joint, and the knee joint, so serving a proprioceptive role. All three of these muscles are going to be innervated by the tibial nerve. Okay? Recall that the tibial nerve is a branch of the sciatic nerve. We had a separate video where we talked about the sciatic nerve, and we saw how it traversed down ultimately to the superior angle of the uh, popliteal fossa right here, and then the sciatic nerve split into two nerves. Uh, one was the tibial nerve, and the other was the common peroneal nerve. All three of these muscles are innervated by the tibial nerve. And go back and watch the video over the sciatic nerve, and we'll explain how that works in a little bit more detail. It's also worth noting that all three of these muscles in the posterior compartment are supplied by the posterior tibial artery. So this is actually where they're going to receive blood from. Uh, it makes sense that it's posterior because it's in the posterior compartment. And again, I have also have another video where we talk about the blood supply through the thigh and then ultimately down into the leg. So make sure to check that out if you're confused about the arterial supply. All right. So hopefully this video made sense to you and gave you some good information about the leg's posterior compartment. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.